Exodus 19 from verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. Exodus 24 and starting from verse 1. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the people of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Amen. The director wrote these words which made it into the script. He said, um, we cannot break the Ten Commandments. We can only break ourselves against them. It was shot in the baking heat of the desert in Egypt, and there were 14,000 people in the cast. It truly was epic, but it was nothing in comparison to the real thing. So let's have a brief, sorry, is this me or is this this? Uh... <laughs> it's not a frog in my throat. Are you okay guys at the back? Can you sort that out? Or is it one of these that's still on maybe? Thank you. It was nothing compared to the real thing. So let's have a brief recap in the book of Exodus. And I want you uh, this evening to try to imagine what it was like. In Genesis 15, uh, God had said that the people would end up being taken away captive. They would go into slavery in a foreign land. And we read in beginning of the book of Exodus, that the people of Israel had been in Egypt for over 400 years. They were oppressed by one of 
if not the most evil tyrant in the world. And when they came to Egypt, there were just 70 of them. But we're told they'd increased in number greatly, and it says they were fruitful and multiplied. I don't know whether you picked up on that. That is a, that is a reference back to the book of Genesis. God blessed mankind, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. And God blessed these people. And it seems more and more uh, the evil one wanted to have a go at them. God blessed them. It says this new king in Egypt, he didn't know Joseph. Uh, well, this was hundreds of years later. He didn't know and he disregarded Joseph's descendants. He treated them harshly. Listen to what it says in verse 13 of chapter 1. They ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service. Can you imagine it? And then came the order to kill the baby boys. The midwives didn't obey. So Pharaoh tells his people to cast the Hebrew boys into the Nile. It really must have been awful. As we know, Moses is rescued in the most remarkable of circumstances. And after what must have felt like a lifetime, uh, because it was, uh, he was 80 years old when God uh, called him. God calls him to be his spokesperson. And to confront the king of Egypt let my people go is the message, and we see God's providence in the life of Moses. There are a few little words tucked away I want to draw your attention to at the end of chapter 2. It says God saw the people and God knew. He heard their cry for help. He remembered his covenant uh, with um, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and he knew. And he knows you too. Wherever you're at, whatever is going on with you, he knows and he cares. He promised that he would bring them out of affliction in Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. And Moses meets the Lord in the bush and through a series of powerful signs, God dismantles and he dethrones the evil tyrant in Egypt and he rescues his people. The Passover and then the rescue from Egypt must be the most significant events in the history of this people. But why does God do it? Because he's faithful. Because he keeps his promises. Because he has committed himself to these people. Because he loves them. And now we're at chapter 19. And we read or we read together, he bore them on eagle's wings and he brought them to himself. Mark those words. He brought them to himself to be his treasured possession. This is an epic story and it points us to Jesus. As we look at chapters 19 to 24 this evening, we're going to focus in on chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. I want us to answer three questions. Number one, what is the law? Number two, how does it function in the life of Israel? And number three, what wisdom is there here for us? So what is the law? In the Bible, the law can refer to a number of things. Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament scriptures is translated in English, the law. It has law in it. It contains the Ten Commandments and lots of other commands given to the nation of Israel. Civil laws, laws to do with service in the tabernacle. There are approximately 613 of them, if you count them all, in the Torah. And these laws can be thought about as instruction or teaching. They have a personal aspect to them 
They are not just a form of impersonal, governmental, institutional laws, though they did constitute the nation of Israel as a nation, but they are laws from a loving God, a heavenly Father. And the Torah is telling the story about the laws given to Israel, and the point is to give us a message from the author about how these people were truly incapable of obeying God's law and how they needed to have God transform their hearts so that they could truly love him and serve him. Specifically here in Exodus, we see that these laws form the terms of God's covenant with the people, in particular, how the people were to relate to God and how they were to relate to one another. And also, they were to show God's character, that he is holy. And they were supposed to mark Israel out as his people, as they kept his commandments. In doing so, they would show the nations what God is like. So the law is good. Brian said to us this morning, he said, I want to underline, I want to underscore, I want to say. And then what he said was, look, we don't have to do these things that he was talking about in order to get saved, as he was impressing upon us the need to live Christian lives that are consistent with our calling. And he said, we don't do that in order to get saved, we do that because uh, we are saved. And that is true here, too. These laws were not given in order to save the people, but because they were God's people. The law is good, but people are not. And we see that in the narrative. The laws come within the story of the people of Israel, and there's a pattern as you read the story in the book of Exodus, Moses gives God's laws to Israel and they rebel. And then he gives some more laws and then there is more rebellion. The pattern repeats over and over again. Both they and we break the commandments. We sin and there are consequences to our sin. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. So the law helps us to see our sin and our need for forgiveness. The laws here, which we refer to as the Mosaic Covenant, are not the only laws or instructions we find in the whole of Scripture. God gives instructions to Noah. We find instructions and imperatives in the New Testament. In fact, some of the laws from the Old Testament are repeated in the New Testament. And there have been many, many words I'm just giving the guys a heads up there to put something on the screen. There have been many words written about how these laws relate to people outside of the nation of Israel and how they relate to us as Christians today. You may have heard people uh, use phrases like the three uses of the law or the four purposes of the law. And you might ask, how do we interpret these laws and how or in what ways are we to interact with them or respond to them? Are we supposed to keep them all? Are we supposed to keep just some of them? People love to discuss and debate these things. And while we'll touch upon them uh, very briefly later when we consider our response to God's word this evening, I don't have time to go through all of the different perspectives and points of view. So if you'd like to spend some more time thinking about these things, I've got two recommendations for you. Uh, one is this book. It's called The Five Views uh, on Law and Gospel. It's about £10, and it'll keep you very busy because there's a lot of pages in it. Alter alternatively, for free, uh, you could have a little look at Don Carson's talk, How Does Jesus Fulfill the Law? Uh, that's about an hour long, and as I say, it's free. I think there's a image there on the screen uh, if you want to know how to get hold of them have a chat with me a little bit later on but now let's get into the text how does the law function in the life of Israel 
chapter 19. Uh, We read that the people encamp at Sinai and they will be there for about a year. The really important thing to get hold of is that God in chapter 19, look down at verse 4, reminds them prior to giving them the laws, he has rescued them. And think about these words. I have brought you to myself. I brought you out on eagle's wings. God's rescue was all of God's grace. Alec uh, Motia says this, uh, that this, the the Passover, uh, the Exodus, and now Sinai, is a huge visual aid of the gospel. It points us to Jesus. And it's vital that we get this. The rescue of the people comes before they receive the law. The law is not something they have to do in order to be rescued. Now, the law will become part of their identity as a nation, uh, and in in particular as a nation that belongs to the Lord. You get a couple of details. Just look down in verse 5 and 6. As they keep the covenant, they will show that they are the Lord's treasured possession, and they will be a kingdom of priests, a nation set apart. Priests represent people to God, And they represent God to people. And in this case, Israel were to represent him to the nations. I don't know if you noticed when you've been reading this passage before, but Moses is told to ascend the mountain. I don't know if you've tried to count how many times he goes up and down. I hope it wasn't too far all the way up to the top because it gets a little bit dizzying. But it's clear that Moses takes on the role of go-between a mediator. And then we get to this famous passage in chapter 20, literally translated from Exodus 34 and 28 and Deuteronomy 10 and 4, the 10 words or the 10 sayings. The 10 commandments have shaped the values of civilizations as the Christian message has spread. And they've served as the legal and moral foundation of the Western world and have shaped its culture. I want you to notice also the placement of these commandments. The Ten Commandments come first and they're given directly from God and they were to be, they were to be put in the Ark of the Covenant which resided in the most holy place. So let's take each of these Ten Commandments And let's make some brief observations. Number one, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Notice that this is God speaking. And the opening words there in verse two could be echoed before each of the commandments because they serve as their basis. What do I mean? I am the Lord, denoting God's authority. Your God. Uh, These are personal, these commandments. Who has rescued you? He's their savior and therefore you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, One of the reformers defined a God as that to which your heart clings and entrusts itself. And the question for Israel and the question for you and me this evening is who will you depend upon and trust in life? If we think of this like the terms of a marriage, it seems right and fitting that Israel should wholeheartedly love and devote themselves to the Lord alone. Can I ask you, what do you love? What does your heart cling to? Is Jesus everything to you? 
Is he enough? He's more than enough. And we need strength to comprehend the breadth and the length and the height and the depth to know the love of Christ. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Don't make carved images. What were these images called? They were called idols, weren't they? Trying to fashion a god in your own making is not only stupid but it's offensive to God it's interesting isn't it the Lord has already made something in his image and that would be you people humans are made in the image of God but we are not at liberty to do the same and we don't have time to look in detail at verses 5 and 6 but we can talk about them after the service if you'd like to know a bit more about them. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. It's interesting, you know this word here, take, is actually the word bear or carry. And when we look at the tabernacle in a couple of weeks' time, the priest would carry the name of God on his garments. This command is not limited to profaning the Lord's name in our speech, though that is obviously wrong. His name is holy. But Israel were to be a light to the nations, and that would be done by representing the Lord. And how they lived would impact what those outside thought about Yahweh. They were to bear his name in a way that would not do damage to his reputation. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son, your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The seventh day belongs to the Lord and he has given it as a day of rest from work it is to be kept holy or separate it's a blessed day and you know this was not a new idea Sabbath keeping existed in chapter 16 when they were not to collect the manna on the Sabbath and it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis now the last six commandments are to do with how they were to relate to one another Five, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given to you. The basic building block of society is family. It brings stability and security. And that is why parents are to be honored. To honor is to esteem them, to consider them as having high value. And this commandment is not just for children. I ask you how... How are you feeling? These standards are high, aren't they, for God's people? Number six, you shall not murder. Human life is important. Murder or all forms of illegal killing are prohibited because life is a gift from God. People bear his image and therefore their lives are precious to the Lord. I find it heartbreaking. I don't know about you. And really disturbing to see how our society 
has such a disregard for life at every stage, whether it be the unborn baby, whether it be the lack of care and love shown towards the elderly, or whether it be people in some stage of life in between who are facing painful circumstances and in some countries are given the option of ending their lives early. It is heartbreaking because God who gave life loves people. He cares for people and they are hopeless without him. You know, it's only the gospel that can bring real hope and healing to broken lives. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Marriage reflects the character of a faithful God. He has made a covenant with his people which he will not break, so they should not destroy marriage by unfaithfulness or adultery. Again, we could say so much, couldn't we, about our culture? The UK divorce rate is 42%. The culture has no idea about the origin or the purpose of marriage. Statistics vary massively, so somebody's not telling the truth, but it's sad to say that somewhere between 20 and 25% of marriages are the victim of infidelity. And what's worse, in one survey that I read, 70% of the respondents said that they would not remain faithful if they thought they would never get caught. God cares about marriage and faithfulness within it. Number eight, you shall not steal. Do not take what is not yours. I was talking to somebody the other day who was telling me about a meter in the house and it had not been fitted properly, so they hadn't been charged the right amount of money for the energy uh, that they had used. Now, I thought he was going to be feeling pretty smug about this, given the recent uh, announcements about charges in energy prices. But he felt that was the wrong thing to do. I could, he, he felt that's not right. So he called in the company and he said, you need to fix this meter because I'm not being charged the right amount of money and he cleared his conscience he felt good about that but then he added on the end he said once they've uh, once they've come and they've fixed it and they've refitted it i know somebody who can come and put something in it which will slow the thing down a bit and uh, and then i'll only pay half of what i'm supposed to be i think what's the, what's going on here double standards he seemed to think that because he'd been honest about it being broken it was okay to steal People have such messed up ideas about right and wrong. Having said that, it does feel like the energy companies are, are stealing from consumers. Be that as it may, God says do not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Truth matters, rela relationships depend upon it. Lies destroy relationships, and there is no such thing as a white lie. Number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. It's interesting, isn't it, when we come to this one? This is a matter of the heart. You see, these commandments were given by God because he loves his people. And he didn't just want outward observance, but he wanted to build character in them. It's about the heart. Don't covet. Be content with what the Lord has given you. This is not easy, is it? All of these things are to be kept because in terms of these last six, this is what it means to love your neighbor. And the commandments are relational and they imply trusting God and obeying God because the people were to love him. Now, I'm conscious of time, so 
We were going to comment briefly on uh, verses uh, 18 through to the end of the chapter, but I'm aware of time, so I'm going to ask the question, what wisdom is there here for us? How should we reflect? One author said, God gives us the commandments not because he has needs, but because we do. No sooner had Moses received the commandments and the people who said that they would do everything that the Lord commanded. Did you notice that in the reading? Three times we will do everything that you command, Lord. No sooner have they said the words and they're found breaking them. Now Moses has designed this in the narrative to make you and I think. We're supposed to think, these people, what's wrong with them? But as we think about that, we realize that often we are the same. We know what God has said and we know that it is good. And yet we are found breaking the commandments two we do what is wrong the commandments are part of the covenant as we've said they're like a metaphor for marriage and God commits himself to these people but the people are unfaithful but I want you to notice this God remains faithful how should we respond we need to realize that the law cannot forgive us or save us. It was never designed to do that. The law cannot give me a new heart. The law shows me my sin. Isaiah reminds us that our sins separate us from God. And I can't keep them just by trying harder. I don't know if you've ever done that. You think, I'll just try harder. And we fail. And the problem is made even worse in the Sermon on the Mount. Because Jesus says that people actually try to make the law small. And they try to keep the letter of the law. But when we consider the spirit of the law, it's much, much harder to keep. You see, it's not just about your actions. It's about your thoughts and your attitudes. In fact, he says you would need to be perfect to keep it completely. And just in case you didn't know, I'll remind you, both you and I are not perfect tonight. So what are we to do about that? Well, there is good news. You see, Jesus is perfect, and he kept all of the law perfectly. And not only that, but he died to pay for the sins that we have committed and do commit when we break God's holy and good law. The gospel is good news. Jesus keeps the law perfectly. He is the one to which the law points and finds its culmination and continuity and he is the one who takes the penalty that we deserve for breaking the law because he loves us his perfect life and his death make atonement for our sin now i just want to make this point if if you are here this evening and you are not a christian you're not trusting jesus I would plead with you. You need to put your trust in Jesus. The one who died to pay for your sin and made it possible for you to be reconciled to God. Come to him. Put your trust in him. Believe in him. And start following him. Because he is able to save those who draw near to God through him. And we too as believers need to remember that scripture, we're to draw near to God through Jesus, who is described as the guarantor of a better covenant, one that works on our hearts. We need God's spirit 
in order to live in the way that God wants us to. Now we don't say that it doesn't matter how I live. I would never encourage anyone to break the law. We are not to do that. We represent the king. We bear his name. And therefore, in the book of Galatians, Paul says we need to put to death our selfish, sinful desires. In fact, if you are a Christian, you have died with Christ. And in a sense, it's no longer you that lives, but Christ lives in you. How does this work? Well, we're told to walk in the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit. And God's Spirit will produce fruit and character and actions in you. Love, joy, peace, self-control. Paul says against such things there is no law. As we daily die to self and reckon the old nature dead and live in the Spirit with his help, we will become increasingly like Jesus. Oh, I know. Uh, it feels like a slow process, doesn't it, sometimes? We need to take courage. Jesus has overcome the world. If we are trusting in him and he has rescued us, he will complete his work in us. In Jesus, our sins are covered. The debt has been paid. And therefore, you and I should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do we still sin? Yes. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. As you grow closer to him, you will become more like him. Your goal in life is this. Remember this if you remember nothing else tonight, Christian. Your goal in life is to love Jesus and to love others as Jesus has loved you. Shall we pray together? Father, it's been a, a long evening. As we look into your word, it finds us out, Lord. And the Lord does show us our sin. And as we look into our hearts, Lord, we confess, we find things there that ought not to be there. We can be idolatrous. We can love other things before you, Lord. We can treat other people in a way that dishonors you, Lord. We pray that you would help us, motivated by the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, to crucify the flesh and the sinful nature, and to seek with your help to love you with all our hearts, and to love our neighbors as you love them, Lord. Help us in these things, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.